Greetings. Hello, Bonte. I hope all of you have had a good week. Yes. And you had a lot of smiles and a lot of laughs. <laughs> okay. So we're going to do the greater series of questions and answers. This is something that I started last week and then I got carried away with the Eightfold Path. Got through uh, the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths. And I want you to realize that the Four Noble Truths are not this simplistic uh, thing to say and do with without really understanding what it's talking about. So many people get into uh, the Four Noble Truths and they can recite it, but they don't understand the deeper meaning of it. And the Four Noble Truths are in every link of dependent origination. And maybe next week or the week after I can get another book and I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now the Sutta today, the greater series of questions and answers is quite a deep sutta. You know, if you're a beginner and you don't understand what I'm talking about, it will become apparent as we go along. Consciousness, consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes, it cognizes. Now what we're talking about by the word cognize is you're seeing it in the present. You're seeing it and recognizing that that's what's happening in the present. That is why consciousness is said. What does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It cognizes, it cognizes. So what we're talking about is that consciousness is arising right with feeling. That's what perception does, it cognizes. <clears throat> and it cognizes by naming the kind of feeling that you're actually experiencing in the present. That is, as soon as a pleasant feeling arises, you cognize that's a pleasant feeling. You recognize it. We don't say recognize because that is coming from memory. And when you cognize, it's what you're experiencing in the present. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? 
wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined. They are together, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely sees, that one cognizes. And what one cognizes, that one wise, wisely understands. Now it's interesting that they use wise in both of these um, parts of the definition because we're talking about deep cognition. We're talking about seeing individual consciousnesses arising and passing away. And this is the very beginning of as soon as that cognition is there, craving arises. And craving is the I like it if it's pleasant, I don't like it if it's uh, painful. And this is the very beginning of the false belief in a personal self. This is the very beginning of taking things personally and um, next what arises is, is your opinions, your thoughts. And your attachments to whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, but it's the attachment to that craving. Craving is a real biggie. You'll hear more about that in a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. But this is the very beginning of how this process of dependent origination actually works. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. What is the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined? The difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Listen closely. Wisdom is to be developed having the ability to see the links of dependent, dependent origination has to be developed. And consciousness is to be fully understood. Now, what we're talking about by fully understood, it is seeing the links of dependent origination and how they actually work and understanding that everything that arises, everything is part of an impersonal process. That means there is no craving when you see it that way. You still have consciousnesses arising and passing away. You still have your uh, life that you're living, but you're living it with the kind of wisdom 
that sees everything as part of a process that is impersonal. There's no distractions when you see it this way. There's no hindrances when you see it this way. So it's real interesting to hit something so deep at the start of a sutta, but it gets even deeper. So we'll continue on. Feeling, feeling is said, friend, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels. Now you can see by that, that we're not talking about emotional upsets, emotional feeling. We're talking about feeling as it actually is. It's either pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant. That's what feeling is. What does it feel? It feels pleasure, it feels pain, it feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels, it feels, friend. That's why feeling is said. Now we get to an interesting thing here. Perception. Perception is said, friend, with reference to what is perception said. It perceives, friend, that's why perception is said. What does it perceive? Now it's going to go into colors, but perception is the very beginning of our conceptual thinking. We only think in concepts. And we take those concepts personally and we cause ourselves a huge amount of suffering because of taking these opinions and thoughts and ideas personally and tagging it as this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. So, as I said, it gets into colors, and this is a, a standard way for the Buddha to talk about it. It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, it perceives white. Now, these are the colors of the Buddhist flag. The Buddhist flag didn't come into being until the very early 1900s when Walcott went to Sri Lanka and he noticed that there wasn't any such a thing as a flag for Buddhists, so he made this up. It perceives, it perceives, friend, that's why perception is said feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend. Are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Now this, is, this gets to be real interesting. because you have these three things in the five aggregates. So that makes it, because they're conjoined, they're always together, not separate. So it makes it three aggregates instead of five. Because consciousness, perception, 
<coughs> and feeling are always conjoined. They're always together. And this will explain this in just a second here. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friends. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Got something down the wrong side. Mm. These states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. A lot of people spend a lot of time with the five aggregates, not realizing that three of the aggregates are conjoined. So it can get real confusing when you see other people um, trying to describe the five aggregates and make sense out of it. One of the things that the translator, Bhikkhu Bodhi, does with the five aggregates is when he describes the aggregate, then he'll say, uh, feeling or consciousness, whatever it happens to be, is affected by clinging. Now, I change that a little bit because it's affected by craving and clinging. And it's only affected when you're already caught in that uh, that aggregate. You're already taking it personally. So quite often when I'm talking about the five aggregates and I run across what Bhikkhu Bodhi said, affected by clinging, I say is affected by craving and clinging, or it may be affected by craving and clinging depending on your mindfulness at the time. So, uh, they are conjoined, not disjoined, and it's impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe a difference between them. Now listen closely. For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one cognizes. This is a real strong statement. And it's see, you see how they are actually conjoined. They are together. And you can see that when you're sitting in meditation and a feeling comes up, then there's the I like it, I don't like it. Or there's, excuse me, there's, there's the perception, which is pleasant or unpleasant. And the consciousness recognizes that right then and there. Okay. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Okay, this, these are states that are knowable by mind alone. Now, what we're talking about here is getting into the immaterial jhanas. Now, ac actually, it's not a jhana. It's a, there's four different parts to the fourth jhana. When you get into the fourth jhana, the only time you have feeling arising in your body 
is if there is contact. Like you will hear a sound, but it's not going to make your mind wobble. It's not going to make your mind uh, jumpy in any way. Unless you keep your attention on that feeling. Now, quite often when I'm giving a retreat, people will come and they'll tell me, oh, I have this pain in my back. And I almost always stop them right then and say, isn't that interesting? Because you don't have a body. You're putting your attention on it. You're making a big deal out of it. You're trying to control it. And who's doing that? Who's taking it personally? Who's trying to control it? Who doesn't like it if it's a painful feeling? Who causes themselves suffering? Now, honestly, when you get to the realm of infinite space, when, well, actually, when, when you get to the fourth jhana, you don't feel your body. Now it's all mental. And if you take the precepts and, and the refuges in the morning and read that little uh, short verses from the Dhammapada, the first thing it says is mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made they are. So how can you have a body if it's mind made? Oh, but I have this feeling in my back. No, your mindfulness isn't sharp enough to see that it is part of this collection of feeling, perception, and consciousness. That's what you're feeling. That's what you're actually seeing. But because there is a specific place that pulls your attention to it, which means you're not in the jhana anymore, it means that you are distracted because your mindfulness got weak and pulled your attention away. So you come and say, well, I have this huge pain in my backside or my back or my arm or my leg. When you come to realize that you don't have any feeling in your body, when you are on your object of meditation, then a feeling arises and it's painful. You start to make a big deal out of it. You start to get more and more involved in, I don't like it, I want it to stop, oh, I can't stand this. Every thought about that feeling causes the feeling to get bigger and more intense. So, when you keep your attention on that, you're not following the six R's. Not anymore. You are keeping your attention on that feeling instead of letting that feeling be by itself and relaxing and smiling and coming back to your object of meditation, what will happen is that feeling will become more and more uh, 
more and more equanimity towards that feeling. And it's okay for it to be there. When it's okay for it to be there, equanimity, when it comes up, is mental balance, allowing, accepting, not, not keeping your attention on anything in particular. Oh, but that feeling, it hurts so much. Well, yeah, it's going to hurt as long as you keep making a big deal out of it. As long as you continue on keeping your attention there. Oh, but it hurts so bad I had to get up and walk. Well, that's kind of disappointing because it says that when you do that, you have taken that personally and you have tried to control it and it got worse and you made it bigger and stronger without realizing that that's what you were doing to yourself. See, you cause your own suffering. You are your own teacher. Learn from that experience instead of indulging in that experience. And the less you make a big deal of it, the faster it will go away on its own and it won't bother you anymore. Now, there are certain times when you get to the Arupa jhanas that your mind is going to throw up some kind of a hindrance like this, because that's all it is, is a hindrance. Anything to distract you. Sometimes that hindrance is going to be fear. Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes it's just a physical feeling. What you think is a physical feeling, but it's not really. It is a mental feeling. When this occurs, there's a couple different ways that you can take care of it. By using the six R's and not making a big deal out of it in your mind, just let it be there. It doesn't, it, it's not going to go away. That feeling is not going to go away anytime real soon. But when you stop making a big deal out of it and come back to your object of meditation after relaxing, it gets to be less and less of a, a problem. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So. Realize how, how tricky your mind can be. Another way you can overcome this problem is kind of make it a joke in your mind and laugh with it. It's only a pain. Did you ask that pain to arise? Did you want that pain to come up? Nobody's that dumb. It came up because of past actions of breaking a precept. And it might not, not be from this lifetime. It might be from a past lifetime. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what that pain actually is or the cause of it. What matters is what you do with what arises in the present. And that dictates what's going to happen in the future. If you keep taking it personally, you get involved with the pain, you start uh, <clears throat> you start dreading the pain, then 
you can look forward to that pain coming back over and over and over again until you learn that it's not yours. Till you see that it's not yours. It's just a pain. Because you didn't ask it to come up, you can't control it, you can't make it go away. This is just part of a lesson that you're teaching yourself in how to have a balanced mind. So this is real interesting with the knowledge of mind alone. Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? Now being released from the five faculties definitely says this is the immaterial realms, the mental realms. Friend, a purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known thus. Space is infinite. Now, when, when I'm teaching you, I generally am teaching the Brahma Viharas. Okay. You're learning all of the Brahma Viharas when you practice the way that I'm showing you right now. And your understanding of how this process works grows very quickly. Sometimes in one sitting, you can go all the way through all of the Brahma Viharas and get into equanimity. I'll explain that a little later. The base of infinite consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. <coughs> This is where you actually see and teach yourself the real meaning of impermanence, suffering, and the impersonal nature of everything. The not controller. The not personally being there. Personal be personally being there means that there's craving and you're not going to be in the jhana when craving is there. And the base of nothingness can be known thus. There is nothing. The realm of nothingness is when you get very, very strong uh, equanimity very strong, nothing excites your mind. And that's when you start developing the ability to have disenchantment with the outside world, with everything. You just don't get near as excited as you used to. And this is a good thing because your mind has a state of balance all the time. It's there, you're seeing things, but you're not looking outside of mind anymore. You're watching mind. Now, when you get into this state, then you'll get to a place where the equanimity disappears. And it's like being asleep and being awake at the same time. You're starting to develop the ability to watch the true subtleness of mind's attention and how it moves. And this is what I call the quiet mind. You sit quietly. You don't have anything disturbing your mind. 
if you see the slightest tiny little movement of mind's attention, then relax and stay with the quiet mind. This is where you get to see the subtlety of the amount of energy needed to stay with that quiet mind. Now there's sometimes your mind might get a little bit frisky and start to think something. Now the sooner you can recognize it, let it be by itself and relax and come back to the quiet mind, the quieter your mind becomes. Now, I, I have had students that can get into this state and stay in that state with a quiet mind for long periods of time. Sometimes it shocks me how long they can actually be in that kind of uh, pure mind. The mind is pure because there are no disturbances. There's nothing moving in mind's attention. And this is when your mind is most pure. And this is the state that occurs right before you experience the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. When you come out of that, you don't even know that you're in that state until you come out. But when you come out, your mind is, it's just like somebody took an eraser and cleaned your mind. And depending on your mindfulness and your, your degree of being able to see this, um, you might be able to see the links of dependent origination and you start understanding more clearly how this entire process works. And it all begins to make complete sense. And you're going to see, without a doubt, the impersonal nature of everything. And this helps you develop even more and more disenchantment, no excitement. You're seeing the process as it actually occurs. And you're teaching yourself how this thing we call life actually does work. It's funny, there's an awful lot of psychoanalysts and, and people that they're just starting to see how this process works. And they're shocked when they see me give a talk on dependent origination because it goes so much deeper than anything that they can measure by machines. It's quite interesting. We're starting to develop some machines now that are sensitive to any kind of movement in mind. And when you're sitting in the cessation of perception, feeling and, of, and consciousness, there's absolutely no movement of mind. And this baffles an awful lot of people. They, they can't believe it. We're trying to get, get it together to have some papers written on this. 
because there's a lot of people that are trying to measure all of this, the movement of mind's attention and figure out where different emotions occur. But when there's no consciousness in mind, there's nothing to measure. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, all of the studies that have been done, as far as I know, are part of the one-pointed type of concentration where there's still some movement in mind, in, in mind's attention. <coughs> Having a tough time today. So the, the more we can get people interested in that, that have the sensitive equipment of seeing what's happening when you sit in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, it's going to blow the, the lid off of a lot of understanding of how this process actually does work. <coughs> I can't get that tickle off my throat. Okay. Friend. With what does one understand a state that can be known? Interesting question. Friend, one understates, understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom. So when you get into the... <clears throat> When you get into the uh, mind states, infinite space, infinite consciousness, joy, um, equanimity, when you get into these states, the thing that sees these is seeing exactly in the present how this impersonal process is developing and how it actually occurs. So, the more you can sit in meditation for a few hours, now, I encourage, especially when you get into the fourth jhana and the arupa jhanas, which is different aspects of the fourth jhana. And it's not the fifth jhana and sixth jhana and seventh jhana. I don't like that. We call them by name. We don't give them a number. And if you're sitting by yourself quite often, what happens with most people is they overestimate what their experience is. So when you start getting into these deeper realms, it's actually really a good idea to be in touch with a teacher that has the understanding of how this process works with this type of meditation. People have different ideas when they get into uh, the 
uh, one-pointed kind of concentration where they're not letting go of the craving. This causes a different kind of understanding. And this kind of understanding is leading away from the Buddha's teaching. So when you are in the immaterial realms, which means the mental realms, you're observing things with a pure mind and you're using the eye of wisdom. And the eye of wisdom always is referring to seeing the impersonal nature of everything. So you see the importance of not taking things personally. And we get caught with that a lot, especially when you're, when you're just starting out, especially when you have a lot of um, problems in trying to radiate loving kindness. When that happens, I highly suggest that you don't try to send loving kindness out, but get into your forgiving. It's amazing how forgiveness and acceptance, when that clears up, how much clearer your mind becomes and how much faster your progress in meditation becomes. Friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? That's an interesting question. Why? Why is it so important to be able to see how this process works? The purpose of wisdom, friend, is to see with direct knowledge. In other words, that's how you're teaching yourself with direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. And that's how you're teaching yourself, understanding how this process actually does work and not resist the sneaky desire of getting into emotional states. The purpose of wisdom is abandoning. Abandoning what? Abandoning the craving. <coughs> Boy, I got coughs, now I got sneezes. So the whole purpose of developing wisdom is to abandon the attachments that we have with living, with our daily lives. Okay, now we're going to get into what they call right view. I call it harmonious perspective. And I've always found this very interesting. Friend, how many conditions are there for the arising of right view or harmonious perspective? Friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right view the voice of another. And we're not talking about my voice, we're talking about the Buddha's voice. We couldn't figure this out on our own. Not even close. So we have to be told about it. And wise attention. After we're told about it, then we have to pay attention. 
to how the process actually does work. These are the two conditions for the arising of harmonious perspective. Friend, how many factors are there? Excuse me. By how many factors is right view assisted when it has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition? When it has deliverance by wisdom for its path, and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Friend, harmonious perspective is assisted by five factors. When it is, when it has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition. And uh, when it has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Here, friend, um, listen closely. Right view is assisted by virtue, keeping your precepts. You will find more and more that when you keep your precepts without breaking them, your mind will settle down and you'll be able to concentrate much more quickly and easily. Learning. Now you're teaching yourself by your direct experience. But it also, the voice of another is important to help you realize how this process actually does work. Discussion. Now, this is an interesting thing because a lot of people that have been practicing straight Vipassana for years and years and years, they're told that they shouldn't discuss where they are or what their experience is. And this is confusing because monks are not supposed to talk about where they are, but laymen can. It's up to them whether they want to discuss it or not. But when you get with somebody that is in the same level of understanding, it's quite interesting conversation and you can learn a lot by their observations and by you helping them with your observations. So discussion is extremely important. But you start talking with somebody that's doing a different kind of meditation and they'll flat out tell you, oh, we can't talk about that. It's against the rules to talk about that. No, it's not against the rules for laymen. It's actually encouraged to be able to discuss with your, your friends, your Kaliamitas, your close Dhamma friends, what your experience is. They might have gone through the same thing and can give you insights into how to observe and understand this process. Now, the last two is very interesting. Serenity, going into jhanas, and insight. Insight is a misunderstood concept because it was codified by the Burmese. Oh, you have 16 insights that you have to see before you can attain Nibbana. Well, actually it's 12 insights that you have to see. The others happen by themselves. But it's so codified that you only start looking for 
this insight into seeing uh, anicca dukkha anatta or this insight in seeing how the process of karma actually works. But the insights that you get with this kind of meditation is you're being able to see and recognize more and more clearly how the process works, your understanding of how you let go of uh, painful past experiences, how you understand more clearly when you do let go, and how that process actually works. So insight is bigger and broader, and you'll have insights into little tiny things. And you'll, you'll all of a sudden just recognize something that you hadn't seen before, and it can be stunning. And you'll sit back and you go, wow, I, I've known this all, my, all of my meditation life, but it's not philosophy. This stuff is real, amazing, fun. I had a student in, in Malaysia that she just started meditating with me and she was trying to get into the philosophy and all of these different ideas and she didn't understand them deeply, but she had a relative that was very strong Christian. And he started talking about religion and how you have to believe and all of these different uh, conceptual ideas. And he would get frustrated with her because he, she would start talking about impermanence and suffering and and the impersonal nature of things. And finally he said, why is it that all Buddhists are so smart? And she came back and she said, I couldn't give him an answer. I don't know. Why are we smart? Because you're able to see things as they actually are. You're able to see how this process actually does work. And there might be some of the things in the Christian Bible and, and teachings about the same things, but they're, they're worded and they're obscure. So it's not easy to understand. So when you start to get into Buddhism, which is, quote, not a religion, Religion means belief in a higher power. And we have belief in intuition. And that's quite a bit different. Anyway, the understanding in studying quote Buddhism, which is just studying Dhamma, the way things actually are, it's much easier to understand because it is put to you in a very simple to follow, organized way. Anytime any meditation that is taught that is complicated. Uh, when I was looking for meditation 45 years ago or so, when I was looking for meditation, I came across these incredibly complicated ways of doing the meditation. And I, it just turned me off, stopped me from 
uh, getting involved with that kind of philosophy, that kind of way of doing things. When I ran across Buddhism, it was put forth in very simple terms. So I took this Dhamma to be for real and I really went for it. And I've been studying it ever since. Right view is assisted by these five factors, factors that has deliverance of mind for its fruit or for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition. It has deliverance by wisdom for its path, deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. So I'll go over these again real quick. Virtue, keeping your precepts. Learning, paying attention to how you're teaching yourself the process. Discussion, serenity, and insight. Serenity and insight are conjoined. They are together. And that's where a big misunderstanding comes from a commentary that was written a thousand years after the Buddha died. And after Buddhism had spread to different countries and it, it got confused because Buddhism doesn't come in and take over religion. It kind of blends in and, and uh, you, you practice a little bit more deeply the, uh, the morality and, and the sense of well-being and your, your work towards happiness and peace. Okay, I'm, I'm getting behind here again. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of, ne of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind? Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a person enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. These are the four conditions for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind? The signless deliverance of mind is getting into Niroda, where there's no consciousness. It's also some in neither perception nor non-perception. There's, there's no signs that come up and distract you away when your mind is on the quiet mind and there is no disturbance. Friend, there's two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs any kind of disturbance that wants to come up, no attention on it. 
and the attention to the signless element. <clears throat> I have some problems with this kind of understanding because if there's no feeling, perception, or consciousness, how can you keep your attention on the signless deliverance of mind? Because there's no consciousness. It happens automatically. Here, it's kind of inferring that you have a little bit of consciousness and you can see this. But that's not true Niroda. Niroda Samapati. Friend, how many conditions are there for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind? That's an interesting question. There are three conditions for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs. Attention, again, I have a problem with that, to the signless element and the prior determination of its duration. Now, when you get deep enough and you can get into this experience where you don't even know you're in it till you come out. And you start practicing being able to do that, then you, you have to develop your determinations. I'm going to sit in this space for uh, two and a half hours. Okay, and then in two and a half hours you come out. Now it's real interesting because I have some students in, in Malaysia that are very active and they are very busy, especially during a retreat. And they are quite good meditators and they can get into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness at will by just pointing their mind in that direction. And they make a determination that they're just going to be in that state for 20 minutes because they got a lot of things they have to do. They don't have a lot of time. So they'll sit in the cessation for 20 minutes when they come out it's just like they woke up after eight hours of, of uh, sleep. They have their energy back. They, they're very clear. They're very um, patient. They're very nice of uh, being able to experience with a clear mind what needs to be done. So there's a lot of useful things that you need to be able to do when you are able to get into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through voidness, and the signless deliverance of mind. Are these states different in meaning and different in name? Or are they one in meaning and different in name only? Ran the immeasurable deliverance of mind. That is the Brahma Viharas that we're talking about here. The deliverance of mind through nothingness. The deliverance of mind through voidness. And the signless deliverance of mind. There is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And there is a way in which they are one in meaning and different in name only. What is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name? 
Here a monk abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Now this might sound familiar for those that are practicing the immaterial jhanas. Likewise the second quarter, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. <coughs> so we're talking about the six directions and the importance of letting the six directions go out as far as it wants to go out. At first, it will, it'll feel like it doesn't go out very far when you first start doing it. And then it just gets bigger and bigger and it, it, it kind of expands to the entire universe with practice. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth quarter of mind. He abides pervading the all encompassing joy imbued with joy. He abides pervading the one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, third, and fourth. So above, below, and around, and everywhere, to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is called the immeasurable deliverance of mind. So each one of these Brahma Viharas are included in this right now, in the immeasurable. It's immeasurable, or they sometimes call it boundless, that there's no end to it. It can keep going out and out and out. And everyone close while you're doing that feels the effect of the loving kindness, which is kind of nice. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through nothingness? Now, I've talked with people about this before. Uh, when I first became a monk, I didn't really have a teacher, a monk teacher. And I decided that I was going to see the impersonal nature of every thought and feeling that came into my head. And I would ask myself, where did that come from? Whose thought is that? And over a course of about six months, I got to go quite deep into the meditation of seeing the impersonal nature. And that's the realm of nothingness. My mind became very, very balanced and clear. And I saw how emotional things, when they first start to arise, can cause so much suffering. So it was an interesting experience. This is called the deliverance of mind through nothingness. And what, friends, is a deliverance of mind through voidness? Now, there's a lot of discussion about voidness with a lot of different philosophical ideas. Uh, maybe next week I will read the sutta on voidness. 
and it will show you what voidness actually is talking about. Here a monk gone to the forest or the root of a tree or an empty hut reflects, this is void of a self or what belongs to a self. This is called the deliverance of mind through voidness. Now there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot of different definitions. This is just one. And we'll get more into that next week, maybe. And what, friends, is the signless deliverance of mind? Here, with non-attention to all signs, a person enters upon and abides in the signless collectedness of mind that is in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. This is called the signless deliverance of mind. This is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And what, friend, is a way in which these states are one in meaning and different in name only? And this is a real interesting part of the sutta. I like it a lot. Lust is a maker of signs. Uh, let me read this. Hate is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. In a monk whose taints are destroyed, that means being an arahat, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind, as pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. Now, quite often I give talks about lust, hatred, and delusion, how that's just another way of describing craving. In some ways, it makes it a little bit more confusing unless you really realize that it's talking about craving. I like it, lust. I don't like it, hatred. I am that the impersonal nature of that. Lust is a something. Hatred is a something. Delusion is a something. In a monk whose taints are destroyed, there are, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump done away with so that they no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of deliverance of mind through nothingness, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion, void of craving. Lust is a maker of signs. Hate is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. In a monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of signless deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. This is the way in which these states are one in meaning and different in name. That is what the venerable Sariputta said. 
the venerable Maha Kohita and his students were satisfied and delighted in the venerable Sariputta's words. So I've been talking for a real long time. <laughs> Sorry, I get carried away. I, uh, I didn't used to talk this long. I used to talk for about an hour and that would be like the longest and then it's then it started stretching out a little bit more as i understand more when i moved to kuala lumpur and it could be with a great teacher his name was k Sri damananda he was used to giving two-hour talks and he expected the talks to be that long when I gave the talks. Now he asked me there because he said, I'm getting old and I don't want to uh, have to give a talk every week. I'll, I'll give it every other week. So I got in the habit of giving two hour talks. And when I came back to the United States, boy, did I get hit with those talks are too long. And uh, I found out that the attention span of most Americans is about three minutes. But as I give a talk, you hear me talk quite often and repeat myself quite often. And this is an oral tradition. So it's important that you hear and it goes into that part of your brain. And that way, that means it'll get stuck in your long-term memory more easily. Anyway, okay. Now, do you have any questions about anything? Yes. Hello. Bhante. Yes. yes. May I be the first to ask this question? Half an hour ago, you talked about the conditions of conditions of uh, arising for right view. One of it is insight. Right. And so my question is, how do you know that you don't know? How does one know that they You'll don't figure know? it out? You'll see something. And you'll go, oh, that's what that's talking about. You will know by your own understanding. That's one of the things that makes this fun. Hmm. It's, okay. not this, it's not this codified way that the Burmese say it has to be this and this and this insight knowledge and this and that insight knowledge. It's not like that. These don't come up in any particular order. Okay. They will, they will arise when you when you finally deeply understand, and it, it can change your whole life having an insight. Hmm. Now True. you really truly understand. Hmm. That's one of the reasons I say you are your own teacher. Hmm. True. Thank okay. you. That was very clear. Okay. Anybody else had a question? Hi, Bhante. Hello. Um, I have a question. The, the first one was wisdom. And I couldn't quite understand what was the wisdom because uh, Buddha is talking about wisely understanding. So where that wisdom is coming from? What, how you define wisdom? Wisdom is seeing things as an impersonal process. Okay. So that's kind of like opposite ignorance. Yeah. Somehow. Okay. Thanks. Ignorance, when you cut down the word, it means to ignore, to not see and truly understand. But wisdom is seeing and understanding. 
and realizing that this everything is part of an impersonal process. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Dante, I have a question. Okay. Uh, I have a little difficulty with uh, uh, hearing words like uh, what one uh, feels, one perceives, and so on. Because for me, it's like, um, first I see something or hear something, that means I perceive, and I don't necessarily no, feel no, no, it. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? You feel. There's a feeling that comes up first, and then there's, there is a perception of the concept of a pleasant feeling or a painful feeling. It's not that you see something, you feel first. And then you perceive it, and then you have the consciousness actually naming it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then so it's, that, it's that way with every sense door. Mm -hmm. Feeling comes up before there's there is contact, there's feeling, there's craving, and then all of the other yeah links uh, links. But that's how it actually does work. And that's why the Buddha said, mind is the forerunner of everything. Okay. Yes, thank you. And okay. another question, okay. if I can, <laughs> uh, uh, regarding six R's. Okay. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes when my mind is quite sharp and quiet, uh, it's easy well, after I've done like the six hours, and then kind of silence. Yeah. A place where I feel very comfortable, yeah. uh, serene. And then should I stay there or should I uh, move back to object of meditation? Because moving back to object of meditation is kind of effort. It in depends on the, on the object of meditation and what it is at that time. Yeah. That is part of right effort, the way that the Buddha set it out. And the six R's are just another way of describing that right effort. So it's always coming back to your object of meditation. But you can come back to your object of meditation with a quiet mind. And you're you're not uh, you're you're radiating whatever object of meditation that is, whether it's compassion or or joy or equanimity or loving kindness. So you're not disturbing yourself. Mm. You have to be careful of getting stuck in one-pointed concentration. You don't want your concentration to go too deep. Okay. That's why, that's why the your object of meditation is so important. Hmm. Now remember, when you come back and your mind is very quiet and you radiate loving kindness, you can still have a quiet mind. You're just radiating this feeling. Mm -hmm. It's not a mental feeling. It is, or it, it's not a, uh, a verbal kind of feeling. It is a real feeling meditation. So bringing up that feeling and having a quiet mind at the same time with practice is very easy. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you do the six R's that they start to happen automatically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. But then 
the I have the opposite situation when the sleepiness comes, and I try to sit more stiff, <laughs> but still it can be so overwhelming. Do you have any advice? <laughs> Well, when it comes, you're not in the jhana at that time. No, definitely. <laughs> Which means that your mindfulness is not near as sharp enough. You have to have more interest in how the process works. Pick up your interest. Don't indulge in that... Uh, uh, dull mind, more interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's... So what, what happens first when you start to feel loving or the sloth and torpor come? What happens first? What happens right after that? See, more interest in how the process works help you overcome the hindrance. but you have to have a true interest in how it works. Now, every time you let go of the sloth and torpor and you come back to your object of meditation, that is a different sloth and torpor that takes over again because your mindfulness didn't catch how the process worked. Take more interest in how this actually occurs. Okay? Okay, thank you. And, sit, and sitting a little straighter does help you catch it quicker. Thank you very much, Bante. <laughs> okay. Any other question? I have a question. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, you're talking, well, the sutta was talking about virtue. And um, I'm always thinking about the precepts and um, the part where it talks about, well, the gossip. What is gossip exactly? Would you recommend not to talk about other people at all? Or is well, it no, it's not, it's not that. It's the making up the stories about it. See, when, when gossip occurs, what actually happen is people start just talking about somebody else not knowing what the real facts are. Mm -hmm. Now you can talk about, if, if you're gonna talk about somebody else, act like they're standing right beside you. And when you talk about them, be polite. Okay? Yeah. But a lot of the gossip, oh, there's so much gossip about me in Asia, it's just remarkable. And they make up all kinds of stories and then you hear what, this, what they're talking about and you go, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me. That's just somebody's imagination and their own gossip. So when I was going to Asia, I used to stress very much, don't gossip, don't talk about other people unless you know the real facts. So talking about other people, as long as it's wholesome, as long as you are talking about them in a positive way and how you appreciate them, then uh, that is away from gossip. Gossip is making up stories. I heard one lady that was talking about the amount of money this one man had. And in a conversation of five minutes, the amount of money that guy had went from like 
um, in in Asia they they do things in in lac, which is a thousand pieces of money. It went from one lac to a hundred in the in in the span of uh, five minutes or so. So she was just gossiping. So nobody really knows what the truth is. Mm -hmm. You can hurt yourself a lot by making up stories that aren't true and then spreading that kind of idea around to other people. Okay? I have one more question. Can it okay. be that... Um, Say it again. I didn't quite hear the first. I just said I have another question. Oh, okay. Can, uh, can it be that one is in a jhana just for a second and moves in and out and is disturbed by thoughts in between? Or right. Anytime you have a thought that pulls you away from your object of meditation, that means that you're out of the jhana. You're not in the jhana at that time. When you six R and come back to your object of meditation, you can get back into the jhana fairly quickly. Okay. Do you understand? Yeah, I, I heard okay. you, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that clear enough for you or do you want more? Well, I guess I'm still not sure about what what the jhana really means or what it is. I, I can Well, feel it's a level of your understanding. Okay, yeah, when you get to the first jhana, you, you uh, have certain things. You have joy arise and you have happiness arise and you have, you're staying with your object of meditation for a, a short period of time, but still you're staying with them. You go to the second jhana you start understanding more clearly how the process works. And as you go to the third jhana, then you start having different things happen while you're in that jhana. You become more peaceful, you become more calm, you have more balance in your mind like that. So the jhanas are just levels of understanding. And you don't even have to know what jhana you're in. Especially in the beginning. It's more important for me to talk to you about what your experience is. And then I can, I can see what jhana you are in. Okay. But it's not important for you to know. A lot of times, I, I won't tell anybody what jhana they're in until we start getting into the arupa jhanas. And then I can be more specific because you have more balance in your mind. You have more equanimity in your mind. And that, that's important. <clears throat> okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Keep smiling. You have a beautiful smile. Please keep smiling. Okay. Anybody else? I have something to share. I have something to share, Bante, about okay. uh, talking bad about people. Talk about the last time we talked about dreams, and so this time again, I had this Buddhist dream. I was in the bus and this conductor, this bus driver was talking bad about a, a group of a country or a people. Right. And at the end, I said to him very kindly and gently, and said, you should not talk bad about people. Why? What is the purpose? You know, I, I, I know I said it very well. I said it very with a lot of kindness. And he, and he 
got his interest. He came running after me like, what else? What do you mean? So then when I woke up, I realized, why did I give him an advice? He didn't ask me for advice. And I felt bad about that, giving advice. Well, that's, that's okay. You opinion? just have to be careful about giving advice. If somebody is angry and you say, yeah. well, just let it go. Don't be angry. They get more angry. So you have to be careful with giving advice. You have to do it in a way that doesn't cause upset in the other person. That's he wasn't why. upset. He was he was curious. He came running after me. He was very curious. Yeah. What, what, what does that mean? How, how, tell me more. Well, good. But I felt bad because it wasn't... A, an advice he why, asked for. Why would you feel bad if you are giving good advice to somebody else? Because he wasn't asked for unsolicited advice. So somebody gives you <laughs> advice, do you get angry at them or do you pay attention to them? Is it bad to good give point. Yeah, no. advice? No. If That's a good point. If, no, I don't if get they're upset. open to it, then you can discuss. Yeah. But don't discuss as if you're the, the expert. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. Good point. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay. Then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dis dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>